Welcome to The Fix. Sit down with copywriting experts Nick O'Connor and Glenn Fisher as they review, discuss and improve real-world copy sent in by you. This is The Fix. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Fix. I am not joined by Nick today. Um, I am joined by a very, very special guest. Um, I'm using very twice, completely unnecessarily, uh, but two, two, two times. Two times, because I'm joined by um, Mr. Derek Walker. Hello, Derek. Howdy. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I should probably ask you how you are, um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to be rude and just get straight into uh, talking. Um, yeah, small but, talk is for the small parties. Exactly, exactly. Um, prior to us speaking and recording, um, I said, I'm going to set this up. I'm not going to, people can go away, they can find out about Derek, they can, um, I'll put some links around this video and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not really interested in that um, for this particular episode. What I want to um, talk to Derek about and what I'm going to use as a platform uh, for this, the theme of this whole episode, I uh, was inspired to give um, props, saying props, I'm not American, um, but I'm going to say props anyway, <laughs> to uh, the person who inspired me to to do this. Um, Mark Pollard, if you've not come across what he does with Sweathead, it's a really good um, podcast thing. I mean, it's the same as The Fix. We don't really know what we're doing, and I'm sure Mark would accept that, although he is uh, apparently a strategy man, and there is some strategy behind his madness. Um, but you should check that out. Um, but he did a video series, um, and he had Derek on, and I watched that earlier on, and I'll put a link below, uh, and Derek was talking about fear, and the fear of creativity, the fact that in the uh, advertising industry, the creative industries, we um, seem to fear the idea of being um, successful, um, which sounds weird, uh, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, It all, also a fear of not just being successful, but being creative and, and unleashing um, the full kind of powers that you might have as a creative, and also a fear of um, which something I like the idea of you you open this whole thing with a my phone's ringing which is very annoying. Um, you op open the whole thing with a fear, a little story just to set it for people who haven't seen it yet of being in a boardroom and people talking about uh, people other people's experiences. And you were kind of sat there thinking, well, this is um, this is nonsense because you're making assumptions about the world that you have no idea about. And you were told the lesson that you took away from that was, I think, one of your boss at the time was like, tell us your thoughts, Derek. You've, you've experienced this. You understand this in a different way. And by speaking out, you were able to put a different slant on what the advertising execs uh, were able to kind of take away from the meeting. So that's a long, rambly way of getting into this. But... I want to basically let you speak as much as possible because I was fascinated by that talk and I'd love to capture some of that here. Um, so let's use that as a platform. We're, maybe if we start with a, do it as a problem solution, where do you okay. think in the advertising world, in the world of copywriting right now, where do, well, I'm kind of leading the question, do you think there is fear uh, to be creative or where, and where, if so, which I'm assuming you do a little bit, um, whereabouts is that fair and what does it mean? What what do you mean by uh, people being afraid to be creative? Oh, dear God. I mean, I think that's the bane of our existence. I think it's why the work sucks. And there's going to be somebody going, my work doesn't suck. Your work sucks. Um, it sucks because when we talk about that, that fear of being creative, First, I'm a, I'm, if we were going to put this on a zero to 10 scale, our fear level would be about 102. Um, we've made being a creative a bad thing. You know, creatives are flighty and egotistical and all of this crap, and they dumped all of that on a person. And then they tell somebody, go, now go do a good job. Think about all those little voices they're hearing in their heads about, you know, you're egotistical, you're arrogant, you're, you're, you're cocky. You don't want to share your creative. You don't want to share your, your sandbox with us, share your writing with us. Let us write. Cause we write. No, see, there's so many voices that the person's afraid to, to, to find their voice because there's so much and a good creative director knows how to move all that away. 
I'll stay there. But I'm hoping I'm answering this question right. Um, so we are about 102 on the fear meter, what, zero to 10. Um, our fear of creativity or being creative is something we bang out of children. Children will be creative forever until they go to school. Then they have to color in the lines. They need to learn the rules and all of this. We're just big children. We've grown up. So good creatives used to know how to go back to being a child and color outside the lines and think what and challenge and ask and all of that. Well, after the crash of 2008, the industry was economically challenged and it decided to be to hand its reins over to business folks. And the first thing they did was beat the creativity out of those creatives. Like a baby seal on a Canadian beach, just club that damn thing to death. <laughs> um, and in doing so, we taught people to be careful, predictable, safe. And fear, people think fear looks like you're, you're frozen and panicked and you can't do anything. No, what fear looks like is you avoid doing the things you don't know will work. Fear looks like not trying hard because you don't know how hard it's going to be received. And all of that is has no place in copywriting and art direction, period. It has no place in advertising. Because the bar keeps being moved every time a, a create a, a company, a competitor that does something really cre creative, the bar is raised. Now, do we come to their level or do we go above their level? Because we're we're working for their competitor. Fear keeps us, well, we're just going to stay close. We're not going to, you know. When I got into advertising, there were a group of people who went, oh, this is the bar? Well, we're going way up here. <laughs> you know, we're we going to make them climb. The, they gotta, they're going to have to catch a jet to get us. And... I think the industry has switched because, and I mean, it's understandable. Nobody wants to lose a job, but nobody wants to scare the client. Nobody wants to piss the client off. Nobody wants to disappoint the client. If you're not doing, if you're not pushing the client, what are you doing? I, 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 agree, I agree with everything you're saying there. I'm going to pick out a couple of things. Uh, mm -hmm. One, um, Yes, we, we have a Nick Nick coined the phrase of he was the first time uh, I, I kind of heard it properly, but uh, we have an idea of going for a um, going for a ten uh, rather than like just going for a seven. You go for a ten or a mm -hmm. one, like it's either the best thing or it's absolute crap. And the only way you can get to the ten is by risking going to crap. If you just do seven, it's like when you do the levels, you can kind of meet it, but to get yeah. a to go and you have to risk and have uh, to lean into your fear that you might get it wrong and it might be the, the crap idea. So I completely agree with that. And I do want to come back to like some practical kind of how can people think about this um, with regards to clients, but I'm going to hold that for a minute. But that idea, something that you, that struck me when you're talking about like going for it and, and like pushing uh, as far as you can, I love the ideas of, of like those voices that were told of like, oh, it's, you're being arrogant, you're being thing, you're trying to like rock the boat, you're trying to do all this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. you you need to do that. Um, you you need to um, use. You described it as being having the fear and working with it, working through it, not being fearless. And I think this was a key thing because I think yeah. people say, um, and and I'm you're not alone. There's, there's there's people out there. I hope I'm one of them. I hope. What we do kind of encourages people to think outside the box, to try that that extra thing, to like go the extra mile, go for a 10 and risk getting a zero. But like, it's not about being arrogant. It's not about like being fearless or like no. annexing the way forward. And like, it, you still have to manage that fear and understand that you are in that fear. I wondered if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. Okay. It comes with practice. Um, what we don't do is we, we see that idea and we go, oh, that would be great, but oh, they don't like that. Well, you know what? Show it anyway. First, learn to sell. 
fake uh, or you want practical advice. The second you learn to sell, the second you understand how to communicate to win, and we do as writers, we understand that on paper and in scripts and the videos and stuff, but we don't know it in person. The second you understand that, then you know, okay, we're showing three concepts. One is going to be on target. And the other two, they're going to be degrees of, of, of more than what is expected. So what you're doing is you're not going in and going, hey, here's three tens. You get no choice. You're just going to, because clients have to grow to this. Yeah. So that's the best practical way to this is you, you start and you try and the little things. Um, the funniest thing is copywriters from my generation learned if that headline died because it was too much. Oh, that son of a bitch is the first line of body copy now. <laughs> I, yeah, you got your headline. You got your safe headline, but guess what the first line of body copy is? Yeah. And you know, and it's so funny to see that just by moving it into body copy, nobody cares. Or very few people care. And you can get away with that. And it's great to read young writers who go, and you can see them in, I see them in student books. They go, there, you read that headline and you go, oh, somebody made them write that headline because the body in the body copy is the real headline. Yeah. They couldn't lose that line. And we've got to consciously think about that as writers. If you can't win the battle and you're not always going to be able to do this from the beginning, then make the copy sing. Um, I was taught that the headline is actually the the very first line of copy. So the next line, the very... So the headline and the body copy are really tied together. When you start thinking about those practical things like that, then it's easier to be up there because see, you practice it. Okay, I showed you a great headline. You went, no, that's too much. That's too hard. And they don't really notice that you put it in the copy because you know how long is the difference between when they pick the headline and when they approve the body copy is weeks, days, months. And they never really make the connect. People don't make the connection that wasn't that the headline that we didn't like or buried it or put it in the copy. I'm laughing. So funny. I'm, I'm laughing because I, uh, I, 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 I just last night I wrote a piece of copy. Um, it, it, actually it wasn't copy. It was, it was a message. It was a communication. Let's face it all, yeah. or whether it's a text to your friend or not, it's a, it's a piece of copy. And I got someone to review it and, um, they looked at it and was like, yeah, yeah, like, oh, I, it's kind of good, it's kind of okay, but that that's a bit much for me, blah, blah. I literally changed, I think, the first, the second line it was, um, and just one little bit of it, and then gave it back and went, oh, what, what do you think of that? And they read it all and went, oh, yeah, I like, love that, that's great. And I laughed to myself because I thought, what a brilliant example of, mm -hmm. I, it's all the same. But they went, oh, I like that bit now, and because it unlocks. But I think in this in this idea of like, from the practical sense of, I know like it's very easy for uh, experienced people to go, oh no, you've got to go for a tent. If you're a young copywriter trying to like push your ideas out there, if you just submit that, you're going to get shot down. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You, you try and mirror those things. You you give. It does mean working harder. It means giving three options and saying, well, look, mm -hmm. here's what you want. Like, I'm a big fan of going to the client and going, here's what you want. I know you. But if you really want to, like, go for it, if you want to be the cool client that goes for the next thing and think, here's this, and that's what you're talking about, you've, you've got to sell the client. And I think so often, uh, and it bears repeating, I've spoken about it before, but you, as a copywriter, you, you, you've, you're, fe you're fighting on a number of fronts. You're fighting on the person who's selling the product or the service, You've got to write the copy. You've got to sell it to the customer. But actually, we forget that we're actually selling to the client as well. Sometimes with as a copywriter, if we want to do the best work, if we want to share the best creative ideas that we've got, we have to, and we know that's going to connect with the customer because we've done our research. We know what we're doing. We have that, that skill. That's what we spend all our time doing. But you have to sell the client first. So you have to learn as much as possible how to do that. Uh, and become, but you cheat. You cheat. Yeah. Like I mean, cheat. Why? How do we cheat? 
when do we start educating the client to better copy? The moment we get in contact with you. Because what I do is I send clients ads that are out there going, what do you, you know, this is really a cool ad. What I'm doing is I'm breaking down that wall. I'm educating. you. If you're writing a newsletter and you know, there's a newsletter out there that has a tone and a tenor that makes it sound like a human being is talking, but the people you're writing for are thinking we're accountants and it should be straight. Boom, 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 boom. Then you introduce them to that kind of work and say, Hey, look, this is what people are doing and getting success with. Because my dad said this to me, to us kids always, he goes, people can't unread words. Once they read it, they read it. Once they've heard it, they've heard it. And what he was saying is, yeah, sure. They may not like what they hear, but it's going to stay with them because that's how the brain works. See, so part of our presentation, if the only time the client is hearing from me is to approve a headline, to approve copy, I failed because I'm not helping the client grow. And I have given clients who would just, well, just, we don't, we work in, and I'll be totally honest, what was it? Um, we're automotive parts. Engineers don't need fancy copy. They just need the facts. And we sent them. Over a six month period, we start sending what their competitors were doing that talked to the engineers like they were human beings. So we're reading the copy to them and it goes, and I think you could have heard a pin drop. We read Dana Automotive Parts and um, the client goes, this doesn't have enough personality. Five months ago, you were telling us we had too much personality. Was, no, 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 no. We we, we got to make people laugh. We got to make them feel something. And you're sitting there going, okay. And, you know, you let them think it's their idea. You're in the car going, that took long enough. But it doesn't hurt me to let him think it's his idea. Oh, God, totally, totally. That's, I'm, I'm, do you know what? I've, 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 I'm always saying about, like, pitching ideas and giving different things, but I've it's a really simple thing, but yeah, the importance of sending, like educating your client and sending them the stuff. If, if you've got a, that's a really good piece of advice. If you've got that client who's kind of pushing back a lot and saying, oh, well, like, I'm not sure you want to be, if you've already been sending them stuff saying, well, this is what Jenny over here is doing, or this is what Clive over here is doing. Mm -hmm. Like th that's what they, they're going to eventually come to you. As you say, the, uh, the yeah. clever bit is. It was their idea all along. You don't need to take credit for that. But you get your creativity out. You get your ads out. And then people are going to uh, think it comes back to building relationships. But that's a, it's a really good tip. Um, and I've, uh, I've got one more for you real quick. Go for it. Um, listen to the client. Uh, one of the headlines I used, and I, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. So I was like, "How? why would we say that? And I looked at him and goes, because that's a direct quote from you. And his and his second in charge went, oh, shit, it sure is what you say all the time. And you say that to customers. And she was like, you say that to customers. And he went, oh, I'd say that? Okay, that headline is great. <laughs> it was, it, you know, we, we, we forget that we are, we, we, if we listen, the client is say things that are really cool and interesting when they're not thinking about it. We should be writing those down. And that's my easiest weapon. So once, once the client realized that was his headline, that headline never got changed. Nothing touched that headline. <laughs> and the rest of the copy had to flow from that headline, of course. So now it sounded just like him. What are the chances I won't be doing three rev revisions? You know, um, I'm not, we, that's why I say we cheat. We haven't been teaching folks to go, well, what if I use his own words against it or her words against, it? you know, that's cheating. Cause we never do that. We're going to logic you to this. Ah, screw logic. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go straight for the jugular. Hey, that's it. Well, I'll get rid of it. But that was your quote. Yeah, no, I, I like it. That's mean about the cheat as well, but that's it. We, we'd talk to, I, I'm, I'm probably, um, a little bit 
um, guilty of that myself, of, of the logic, like say, no, but this is how it, I know how this will work. You should try it better this way. This is the logical business decision to use this good copy. But that's not how people work in the same way that people wouldn't react to copy in a logical way. They're yep. reacting in an emotional way. Logic is for later on down the sale. sale. That's the, the back end of the sale. It's all emotional. Front. It's the same with the client. If the second you pick up that pad and you start scrolling through your pages and notes and you go, no, remember when we were taking the tour, you said this. And that's that. Oh, it, there's no argument. I'm not. You're arguing with yourself now. You're not even arguing with me. So, and I've looked at a couple of clients and gone, so is that not? Was that not true? And you know, they look at each other. Oh no, that's true. That's true. We said it. <laughs> yeah, stick like that. But do you not want the world to hear that? Oh no, the world's got to hear it. Ego. Ego. Oh, you know, too and, much ego in the world. That's the. Uh, that's and the, the funniest. And the funniest thing is, I won an award with a piece of copy once for an ad. We won an award for an ad, and the client insisted on getting an award. He's like, "Wait a minute, no, no, no! A lot of that copy was what I said. You just moved it around." I'm like, okay, and we got him an award. It. We go into this thinking. Our creativity and our brilliance will win over. But we're dealing with human beings. So you cheat. You you know, it's, how can I get this ego? And I don't mean nothing. To, uh, clients, we love you. But a lot of clients that have built big things are egotistical. So stroke their ego. Don't kiss their ass. <laughs> don't become a yes person. But know when to use them against themselves. Know when to, and if you're not listening to the client, you can never do that. That's good. And cop copywriter is a good, a great copywriter is a is an excellent listener. And that's the part people don't get. Yeah, I, I write words all day. I talk all the time, but I'm also listening a lot. I listen more than I talk, and that's the shit. That means that's a whole bunch. But um, real quick on that fear of success, and that, that, that one's running in my head real quick, so let me get that out. Every human being knows how to lose because we lose a fucking lot. When we were kids, how many times did we fall learning to walk? We only learned, we only, we only succeeded at walking once, and we never stopped. <laughs> you know, we learn to fail. We learn to live with failure because that's part of life. But how many times have you had a big win? We don't know what a big win feels like. So sometimes when we try these ideas, we have to figure, realize what we're, what's really holding us back is the fear of the unknown. We've never had a client cry or laugh out. I mean, belly laugh at a headline or made consumers call in and go, I don't ever want to see that ad again, but I'm going to buy the product, you know, because it was so emotional. We won't, you don't know. I was doing a, an, an ad campaign for the breast cancer foundation, Susan G. Coleman. And we presented to them and the NFL because the NFL players association is one of their, used to be one of their big sponsors. And we finished and the football players were crying. And we don't know what to do. You know, I'm you're standing there, you you are you're here too small. I wasn't as fat as I am now. So I was like 170, 80 pounds. And we're in the room with these 300 pound guys and they're and they're crying over the spot. We wanted people to feel we didn't know they were gonna cry. So what do we do next? You know? We're in unknown territory. They they approved the budget beyond the budget we asked for for the for the scripts and we shot them and had a great time with them. But the the fear would have think about what if I had been afraid to show them something emotional because, you know, I, they don't really want to see that. Um, that's so when you know it's it, it's like everybody goes fishing, but what happens when you land 
a three or 400 pound fish, you know, you're not, you're prepared for that two or three pounder. But that once it goes above a hundred pounds, you're like, what am I going to do with it? You may not even have a boat big enough for it. That's the old man in the sea, isn't it? The story, the, the, he landed a fish bigger than his boat. He wasn't prepared for that. No. And we are not prepared for success. I was just going to, I was going to say, it's, we're kind of touching on it. Um, and, and this is what I wanted, was going to ask that idea of, we started, um, saying about the voices, uh, that we have, um, you, you, mm -hmm. um, you, you're not like negative voices saying you, you're arrogant by trying to like be more creative, you're being weirdest thing, but all these things are, are bad, bad, bad. And that coupled with the idea that we're not really trained, we're trained in this kind of failure way and, and what have you, and we're not prepared to be successful. It's kind of, especially in Britain and especially in the UK, oh, yeah. a, a re, we, that's like a national identity is to like be Hugh Grant fumbling. Sorry about yeah. that. I'm not a uh, thief. So it's particularly bad over here, but I know it's um, the same kind of thing, especially in that creative mindset. You kind of spoke about a little bit about that in the sense of um, preparing to um, to be successful, to for thinking right. Well, what what will happen if this thing? What's what's the outcome? I wondered, like, do you have any uh, like thoughts um, and 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 tips, kind of for how to change your own mindset? You're someone now. You've you've got that confidence um, to to think outside the box. You've used these cheats you've you've got clients that you can kind of think but what in your experience has got you to a place where you can feel confident and be prepared for that success not ever prepared for that success never am i'm pretending to be confident while i miss while i'm scared doo doo -less. the guy inside the, the, the little Derek inside my head is going, don't do it. We don't know what's going to happen. Once you jump out the plane, you got two options. Pull the chute or die. Can't go back to the plane. What, what ends up happening is you practice being confident. You just have to practice it. And I mean, even when you're afraid, you practice being confident. You know, um, I step on, I step in front of a group of people and I'm in a terror. But I've learned to keep a good face, not show the fear, and go on with the presentation. Go on with this, go on with, with whatever the meeting is. But let's not, it, it, don't deny the fear. You know, that's the problem is people go, well, I, I need the fear to go away. No, what you need to do is be able to handle the fear. We're all, and we do it all the time. I mean, think about job interviews. How many times are you, there's a fear in you when you take, when you go on that job interview, but you go on the job interview. So to me, it's taking those, seeing the, the, that we've done it before and then applying it. You know what? I have no idea what's going to happen if I present this idea, but I'm going to present it. I've got other ideas that they can like, but this is the one it's in there with them where we don't, where we get in trouble is we don't practice putting them in the, in the pile, you know, and it, I don't put them in the pile and then draw attention to them. Like this is the one you're really not going to like. Well, like, okay. This is the first idea. Here's the second idea. And the second idea is actually the one that I'm thinking will never get us any, you know, but I don't go. The second you tell people, oh, this one's going to shock you. See, it's part of learning to sell. Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, really important. It's, it's, it's from the early 1900s, but it's so true. When you get in there and you learn to sell, you don't make those distinctions because those distinctions human beings pick up on. Now I'm going to need you to, I'm going to need you to, to man up and, and, and get ready for this one. I'm about to show you that setup fucks you up. <laughs> you know, you, what you don't break that rhythm, you present this and then let them go. Oh, 
Well, that might be a little too much. But see, if you go in and go, okay, this one's really going to shock you. This one's going to push you. You don't like that in movies. Why would you like that in books? Why would you like that in a presentation? You know, you, you've, all, you, you've prepared the person to say no. You've given them a reason to say no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the little practical things are to do and keep doing and keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. My art director, um, James Ballard, has one of the best quotes. He goes, I asked the girl out back in 1982, and she said no. So I quit asking women out. And the client went, what? And I said, exactly. When you say you tried a TV commercial 20 years ago, and it didn't work. He said, did you stop dating? And I'm like, oh, damn, that's fucking brilliant. You know, and, and, but you have to remind yourself of that. Rejection's part of life. You're going to, you're not going to win all of these, but you show them. And remember the idea of showing is exposure. Um, the first time we gave our sons gelato, they loved it. They didn't like anything but chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. Coffee and cinnamon, no. Pistachio, no. Um, Malaga raisin, no. Rum raisin, no. None of the fancy flavors, daddy. Just chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Now you can't pay them to eat chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry <laughs> as adults. Because... They start at a base and everybody, you understand this with clients. We're starting at a base. What we go in as we're at war with the client where we're not. If you've ever had a two or three year old, you'd understand this. What you're going in is you're trying to get a two or three year old to eat something they've never tried before. That looks yucky. You got to be patient. You got to be consistent. You got to show that you're okay with it. You know, I, I, psychology is just parents are master manipulators. You know, my, I now know why my mom would go, no, this is an adult plate. I want an adult plate. <laughs> why can't I have an adult plate? No, eat your hot dog. Mommy and daddy are going to have these, this asparagus and steak and baked potato, but you can have a hot. Oh, so, you know, your head, you're a little bit, you, you're thinking, well, that shit ain't fair. I got teeth. I, I want some of that, that asparagus and baked potato and steak because that's an adult. Now, if she had said, here, try this, try this, try this, try this, the the rebel in me, no. Mm -mm. See, so she was playing games with us, manipulating us. You know, hey, I want that. We have got to get to the point that we understand we're in, we're trying to coax people to be better. I'm not saying that clients don't know. I'm saying that we're educating them on something we do every day. We should be better at this than the client. And that little nugget of truth in that will give you the confidence to go, well, I'm going to show them a great headline. I'm not going to call it a great headline. It's going to be in the, in the group of headlines. I'm going to show them some, some copywriting with, with character. And there's a lot of, of degrees between a Robin Williams voice and an and a scientist or an engineer who's just numbers and facts and figures. So think about how you you soften your copy over a period of time, and they clients don't even notice. What we go in is, well, no, we're going to change it all today. No, you're not. No, and. That's a, that's a foolish move, but the practical steps are patience, understanding, and a willingness to educate. See, as long as you do all of that together, you get them there. It won't be today, but you know what? It, it won't be three years of this. You won't be writing that same crap for three years. I have never worked for a client where the copy stayed the same. You know, um, the funny thing is, is if you have a really 
great educated client once again cheat. You know, it's like, oh, did you know, celebrate the success. I wrote for client A and that one gets this many emails and this many comments and this many, this much feedback. Well, why didn't mine? Well, and you said all of a sudden it's like, well, yours isn't written the same as in, in as freely as theirs. Why not? Well, that's not what you wanted. Who said that? You sort of did. Well, well I, let's let's see something like that, but not too much. And you just start dripping it in. Yeah. I, I don't think advice. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake in the world is that art directors and copywriters used to be strategic in their thinking. And I think we still are. I, I, you Brits did this to us. You separated strategy from the creators and the account service people. But when strategy was developed by account service folks and by creatives together, then we learned to be strategic about everything, including how to win getting an ad out the door and getting approval on a copy. So I think we have to be strategic and I'm not, saying we're strategists they can keep that job but what's your plan to win when you're presenting do you show the the crazy idea first do you show it last what's the pacing of the of the presentation when people don't think about that pacing means i start sort of strong but my favorite is buried in the middle so it's like you start here then you go up and then you come back down so you're finishing, you don't, people think that the last idea is, it should be the strongest. I think the middle idea should be the strongest or the favorite, because what happens is then you're managing expectations. You started with an average, you went above average, and then you came back to average. And people don't realize it, it changes how people approve work. And nine times out of 10, they go, oh, that was, I like that one. At the end, they go, I like that last one, but that second one was so nice. Um, this, this is why presentation skills are so important. Overcoming objections. Um, if you, for the love of God, if you can, read your copy to the person. If you can't, at least be in the room or on the video when they read the copy for the first time. And sit and listen. Um, and try to get feedback then. Because most consumers are not going to read it and come back to you two weeks later. As I sat down and I meditated on this. No, get train them on reading copy the way customers read copies, the way human beings read copies. They pick it up, they read it, and move on. I know clients have invested money, but we've got to train them to be consumers when they're reading the copy, not clients. That was to your point earlier. Yeah, you know, it's very true. We, what we do is we let them sit and meditate on it, but nobody else is reading it like it's a dissertation. It's one of the reasons we... Uh, we regular fixed viewers know we we read everything aloud and whenever we do copy reviews first thing we do we copyright submits a copy we read it aloud without looking at it without knowing what the what mm -hmm. the product is what are the pitches what the context is we just read it aloud because that is ultimately how people are going to experience it they're going to see it they're coming they've just had a toilet they've been to the toilet they quickly got to go downstairs they're seeing this thing you've got a split second where they're going da -da 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 -da, what oh, okay no one is going away and deliberating over an advert. Like it's just, it's not how it works. So like you need to, as you say, you need to recreate that. What I think is really, um, for me, a good takeaway is, is, is you've got to get, again, your clients to think like that as well. It's not just the customer, it's your clients. If you give them the chance to change stuff, they will change stuff. It, it's yeah. just how we work. It's the same, you go to a legal department, they are making changes even if it was entirely perfect, they have to make changes to show that they've done something. 
It's the same with any client. If if you go into a room, that person's got baggage. They need to prove that they've got something to say about it. Mm-hmm. So it's just, again, understanding that, giving them something to say, as you say, like, okay, I'm not keen on this one, but this one's cool, like blah, blah. Learning to like hide your little bits here and there and do that. It's just a constant thing. And I think it, it comes back down to it, and you probably agree, it, the onus is on you. The onus is on you as a copywriter. If you want more creative work to get out there, if you don't want to sit there kind of going, oh, God, the advertising industry sucks, blah, blah, you've got to embody that yourself. Um, I, I love the idea of what you're saying about the um, the combination or, or rather what's happened. Because I always discuss this, like my, my, girl, my girlfriend gets bored of me like discussing, like why is the bad copy? One of the reasons of that is, is because it's all creative where people go away and deliberate and go, well, what if it was this and thing and trying to mm-hmm. understand all this. And there is a lot of reasons for that. But at the same time, a lot of the time, to- a lot of the reasons is because I, I have the copyright. I've probably been lazy and I've not tried to convince that client of why that's there. And then I'm next week turning around going, God, that client keeps turning around and like pissing me off because mm-hmm. I've not done this thing. But actually I should be the one as the copywriter, as the creative going to that client, seeing it as my responsibility to go, okay, cool. Why do they keep rejecting that even though it's the thing? Because I haven't sent them what good copy looks like. I haven't told them what this is going. I haven't told them what other people are doing. That's my call to do that. That will in turn empower you to make you feel like, all right, okay, now I feel more confident because I'm mm-hmm. I'm, I'm saying this. I, I sound, I, see, I know what I'm talking about. It sounds cool. Like, so it all like feeds into the same thing. It's a, it's a, Really interesting. We we've and uh, we don't uh, part about it. The way we do something at the very beginning of the relationship that I think all copywriters and art directors need to do. We explain how they need to look at the work, and we don't just explain it. We help them get to that point. And it's so funny that different members of the client side team will get there sooner or later, but they'll drag everybody. The first one to get it, excuse me, will become the champion for the agency or the copywriter. So I'm explaining that, no, you need to, you can't read this as Apple. This is an Apple ad. You can't read it as an Apple. You have to read it as the people we described in the, in, as your customer. Now, not everybody can step out of their skin that quickly. But what happens is when the first person does and goes, okay, so if I'm a customer of Apple, I'm thinking Apple's creative and innovative and and easy to use and all of this. And and then you go, yes, you're right. Guess what you've just won? You've got one of the team now on your team. And they're going to be like, no, 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 no. See, and it's easier for them to tell other teammates, you're reading it like we're the, we're the client, not the customer. And I've seen this and I'm gone. Oh, that'll work. And you don't think, you know, I learned this from some, <laughs> excuse me, old ad guys 30 years ago. And you don't realize that they, I didn't realize what they were doing, but they were like, no, no, see what you do is this. And you look, and when you're talking about art direction, they explain kerning and letting of words, the letters and words. They, you know, you don't want a widow and it's so amazing to see clients pick up on those words and go, okay, is that a widow? <laughs> is, you know, and the best one is, I think, um, oh God, who was it? I forgot who it was, but the, the clients, the young lady said, this isn't grammar class. This is advertising. To her team. <laughs> she should employ her. Like she should be yeah. in an agency. That's good. Yeah. She's like, it's gotta it's gotta talk the way the people talk. And you know, you're sitting there going, Yes, our mind <laughs> control has worked. I was gonna say it feels like inception. Uh but yeah, but you're right, it's uh, it's great. So I'll think about our education. When I sit down with a client at the beginning and go, Okay, but this is how I need you to look at it. Um, do you understand that contractions make things softer in conversation? What pronouns are we going to use for you? 
Are we going to do this in first person or third person? Why, why would we do this in that voice? What voice do you need? All of those elements that we take for granted as writers, we have to give them the time to absorb and learn that this is what makes good copy. And when we do all of that, guess what happens? We don't have to fight as hard, you know? And the funny part is, is you start seeing if you do it right, if we really do it right, the newsletters get better. And then the sales team's going, well, my sales sheets are sucky. Why is my sales, why is my sales sheet the, the same as my newsletter? Two different writers. Well, I need the sales sheet to be like that. And see, the evolution creates more business for us. It's good business to educate our clients. Yeah. No, definitely is. Definitely is. Uh, Derek, I'm going to, uh, I think that's a good place to stop. That you, with, there's far too much good information. It's ob obscene that uh, people can get on the internet and get this stuff for free. It should be thousands of pounds. Um, but thank you so much. Um, I've, You're welcome. I'll, I'll wrap it up there. As I say, it, We've not covered who you are, what what you do, and where you come from. People can go and find that, and I encourage you if you I want. Hate talking about me. Yeah, people can go and find that stuff. Uh, that's what the, this this show is not for. That you can uh, go and find Derek. I'll put some links um, below this video and 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 on the podcast. You can find stuff. Um, you'll be able to find it. Um, watch that video um, on Sweathead. It's really cool. And watch this back again and uh, and and listen listen um, as you would say, Derek. Uh, to what um, is coming away because there's some really, really good ideas there. Um, and again, it comes back down to educating your client. If you're having that problem with creativity, you've got to educate your client. But I think you've covered some really good um, good ways of doing that that I've not really covered before. So thank you very much, Derek. You're welcome. Thanks for your time, mate. If you enjoy The Fix and want to get access to even more good stuff, join The Fix Accelerator today. Get access to special masterclasses from Nick and me, watch expert interviews with industry legends, join live copy feedback sessions every week, and get connected to our very own private copy network. Visit thefixaccelerator.com for more information.